So just uh, before we dive into the content of the lectures to, uh, today, I would just like to go through some of the key points of the last lecture and to highlight some of the most important things that you need to know for the various assessments that you'll have on this uh, unit. So when we think about the casting process, one of the most important considerations that we need to bear in mind is the solidification process by which the molten metal uh, after being poured into the mold is allowed to cool and to solidify. Uh, the metal may flow through a variety of uh, channels like the pour and basin initially, the sprues that will then connect to the runners um, and also the rises and the gating system um, until the entrance of the uh, molten metal into the mold. And there are some important considerations in terms of the flow of the metal through these different channels. Um, and in terms of the, the casting process, uh, this is normally um, important to, to have in mind. The flow of the molten metal into uh, the flow cavity. So this is something that we need to control in order to avoid the generation of the effects as we've uh, discussed in the previous lecture. Also, uh, the solidification process and the way that we control the solidification process of either pure metals or uh, alloys is extremely important in terms of the mechanical properties of the parts that we are uh, casting. And also, importantly, in terms of casting is the type of molds and the materials that we use uh, to generate the molds where we will cast our uh, parts. The main factors affecting uh, the solidification of metals, as we've seen in the previous lecture, and the cool down um, of the material until it reaches the ambient temperature, are, for example, the type of metal. As we've seen, there are differences between the pure metals and alloys. The thermal properties of uh, the metal that we are casting as well as the mold. And this has a direct influence in terms of the exchange of temperature that happens during the solidification, the final properties of the parts that we are casting. Uh, the geometrical relationship between the volume of the parts and the surface area of the casting. So this again, plays an important role in terms of the solidification process and can increase or decrease depending on this ratio. And obviously uh, the shape of the molds as we will look a bit more in detail in the future uh, lectures. Again, and this is something that you need to uh, have present is the difference in terms of the solidification between pure metals and alloys. And the main difference is that pure metals, because they have a very well-defined solidification or freezing uh, temperature, uh, the solidification will happen at a constant temperature. Uh, as in the case of alloys, this will happen over a range of temperatures, the temperature that we normally define as the liquidus and the solidus uh, temperature. Also, uh, the composition and the cooling rates of the molten metal, as we've seen, can affect the size and the shape of the grains, uh, not just in pure metals, but also in alloys. And this, again, will have a tremendous impact on the mechanical properties of your cassette parts. So slow cooling rates uh, normally result in coarse uh, dendritic stu structures, uh, with very large spacing between the, the arms of the dendrites. And this happens because we allow time for the material to develop these structures. Uh, but if you increase the cooling rate, so if you cool the material very fast, this will normally result in much finer grains and smaller spaces between the dendrite arms. Also, the structures that are developed and uh, the, the grain sizes that you, that you obtain affect the properties of the casting. So as we've seen, as the grain size decreases because we accelerate the exchange of heat, the strength of our material will increase, but the ductility of the alloy uh, 
will uh, decrease. Also, because we have finer grains, we have uh, less voids between the particles, and that will obviously result in a decrease in terms of the porosity of the casting, which is beneficial because what we want to obtain, ideally, is a 100% solid structure. And also, uh, the grain size, um, by decreasing the size of the grains, the chances of having uh, cracks uh, or hot tearings during the solidification from the molten state to the solid state will also uh, decrease. And in this way, we can also minimize the chances of having hot tear uh, defects. In the previous lecture, we've also looked at uh, how can we uh, design uh, sprues with appropriate geometries in order to avoid turbulent flows that normally result in the aspiration of either gas or solid particles into our metal, at, and that will then result in the generation of defects. So the Bernoulli theorem and the uh, law of mass of flow continuity are two of the analytical tools that we normally use to design casting uh, systems uh, with the goal, obviously, of achieving an appropriate flow rates and therefore eliminate the defects associated with the flow. So remember that these are two important analytical tools. They are used to design appropriate uh, sprues that normally need to be tapered, and this avoids turbulent flows that normally result in aspiration and subsequent uh, generation of defects like porosity. So these are just some key points of the last lecture uh, that you uh, should uh, know. Today, we're going to be looking at the fluidity of molten metal. Uh, we're also going to be uh, discussing some common tests to measure the fluidity or the ability of the material to flow throughout the channels into the mold. Uh, how can we um, calculate the solidification time of uh, a casted part, but also uh, this uh, solidification time or the way that we calculate solidification time or the tools that we use to calculate solidification time don't apply exclusively to the casted part, but also as we've seen in the previous lecture, can be applied to calculate the solidification time of the material that we have in the riser. And remember that the riser or the solidification time of the riser needs to be um, higher than the solidification time of the cassette part in order to ensure that we have always molten metal in the riser to compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that normally happens inside the mold. And finally, we're going to look at some defects in metal casting, uh, not just surface defects, but also uh, internal defects like porosity and what can be the effects of these defects um, on uh, the mechanical properties of our uh, parts. So the capability of the molten metal to fill the mold cavities is uh, normally defined as uh, fluidity. And this consists of two basic factors. One, the characteristics of the molten uh, metal, obviously, and the casting parameters that we use. So these following characteristics of the molten metal uh, influence the fluidity. One, uh, the viscosity. So as the viscosity and uh, its sensitivity to temperature uh, that is normally defined as the viscosity index, as this viscosity increases, obviously we have more difficult in terms of uh, forcing the material to flow into the, mold, into the mold cavity. So the fluidity will decrease with an increase in terms of viscosity. Also, the surface tension has an enormous impact in terms of the fluidity of the molten metal. A high surface tension of the liquid metal that you are casting normally reduces the fluidity. And how does this happen? This normally happens because of uh, oxide films 
on the surface of the molten metal. Uh, and the formation of these oxide films have a significant adverse effects on the fluidity. For example, an oxide film on the surface of a pure molten aluminium normally triples the surface tension. And this, uh, as a consequence, uh, consequence of that, will reduce the ability of the material to flow. Inclusions, uh, and in this case- uh, Excuse me, sir. Yes, I, I can answer. Is that, is, do you have a question? Yes, all right. Can you explain? Uh, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will answer if you don't mind. I'll answer the, all the questions uh, towards the end of the lecture. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. Yeah? Sorry. Okay. Thanks. So inclusions, normally uh, solid inclusions, they can also have uh, a tremendous impact on the fluidity. This can be easily verified by observing, the, the, for example, the viscosity of a liquid, for example, uh, oil, uh, with and without uh, sand particles. Uh, the liquid with sand in, uh, um, in it will obviously have a higher viscosity and will be less fluid and therefore will be much more resistant uh, to flow. The solidification pattern, uh, so in, in other words, the manner or, or the way in which solidification takes place can also affect uh, the fluidity. Also, the fluidity is inversely proportional to the freezing range. So the shorter uh, the freezing range or the shorter the solidification range uh, of the material, as for example, in pure metals, the higher will be uh, the fluidity. Conversely, uh, for example, alloys with long uh, rain, uh, solidification ranges, such as uh, solid solution alloys, have uh, a much lower uh, fluidity. So if we increase or decrease the range of temperatures in which the material will solidify, we can control the fluidity of that material and the ability of the molten metal to fill in the mold cavity. The degree of uh, superheat, it's normally defined as the increment of temperature um, of an alloy above its uh, melting temperature. So each material has a defined melting temperature. The degree of superheat is the amount of temperature that we supply uh, to that uh, material uh, above its melting temperature. And the more uh, temperature we provide, the higher the degree of superheat, the higher will be uh, of the ability of the material to flow, or in other words, the higher will be the fluidity because we are delaying the solidification uh, process of the material. The point temperature often is specified instead of the degree of superheat, uh, but simply because it's uh, easier uh, to specify uh, in red, in, instead of the degree of superheat. And uh, the rates of pouring. So the slower the rate at which you pour the material into your casting system uh, and also into the mold, the lower will be your fluidity and mainly because of the higher rates of cooling. So if you pour the material uh, slowly, you will give or you will allow more time for the material to exchange heat with the surrounding environment and therefore you will decrease the, um, the, 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 the ability of the material to, to, to flow. And in a similar way, the heat transfer rate, okay? So as uh, in the same, in the same, it will happen in the same way as the rates of pouring. So how can we measure the fluidity uh, of the different materials? Uh, for example, before we actually start uh, manufacturing parts using metal casting, it is important that we know what is the fluidity of the material. So what is the ability of the material to flow? And that will help us design our casting uh, system, but also to define the temperatures at which this uh, process will occur, not just during the pouring of the material, but also throughout the entire solidification process until we retrieve our part from the mold. So in a common test, the molten metal is uh, made to flow along a channel that is at a room temperature. So the material is poured 
into this uh, cup. It flows down the screw and it will, it is allowed to flow um, along these spiral uh, channels. The distance the metal flow before it completely solidifies and stops from flowing is uh, normally used as the measure of its fluidity. So the fluidity index is the length of the solidified metal in the spiral passage here, uh, illustrated in this dark uh, gray. But the question is, does this actually represent exactly what happens in metal casting? How close is this system to what we have in a metal casting um, uh, system? Uh, here we have a pouring cup, we have a sprue, but all the remaining channels, the molds, the different features that we have, are they captured in this uh, test? And the answer is actually uh, no. So, for example, if we assume that the specific uh, material, in this case an alloy, gives a spiral uh, fluidity using this previous test of 600 uh, millimeters. I think the first question we need to ask is how does this actually correlate to, for example, a bottom gated casting with a wall of 300 millimeters high and two millimeters thick? Well, it doesn't. And will the casting feel or not? Well, we don't know. We don't have actually the molds and we cannot capture the features of the molds with that system. And can we actually predict if the material will uh, solidify before actually filling the casting? And we can't. So it's a very simplistic approach to actually measure fluidity. And if we want to have a much more reliable and robust measure of fluidity, we need to design testing systems that can capture all the feature of the casting. And this is an example of how these systems, traditional systems could be improved. And in here, what you have is the pouring cup, you have the spruce, but then you have all the running channels, similar to what you have in a casting uh, mold. And you can change different parameters. You can change the length of your uh, runners. You can change the thickness. And this allows you to simulate different conditions in your mold. And by doing so, you can have a much more accurate and realistic measure of the fluidity for your specific casting system or for your specific parts. So <laughs> as, as we've seen also uh, in, in the previous uh, lecture, the heat transfer process uh, from the moment that the material is poured into your casting system until it solidifies, it's extremely important. And it has a tremendous impact on uh, the properties of your casted parts. So the heat transfer during the complete cycle from pouring to solidification and to cooling at room temperature already outside the mold is also an important uh, aspect in metal casting. The heat flow, as you can see in this, uh, in this graphic, at different locations is a complex phenomenon and depends on several factors that relate uh, to the material cast, uh, but not just the material cast. It also relates to the mold, the features of the mold, geometrical features, dimensional features, uh, material features of the mold, and the process parameters. So the parameters at which that we impose for the casting of our metal. Normally the heat from the liquid metal is given off through the mold wall, um, as you have in, in here. And this is normally where it starts your solidification process. Uh, and the temperature drop at uh, the hair mold uh, wall, so in here, as well as at the interface between the molds and the metal is normally uh, influenced by the presence of boundary layers and imperfect uh, contacts at these uh, interfaces. Uh, the reason why I've decided to include this graphic in here, besides showing you uh, the, the normal uh, uh, positions or locations at which we have temperature drops or we have where we have the exchange 
of heat that promotes the solidification of your metal. Uh, it's also to uh, inform you that the shape of this curve is not something static, okay? It's something that it depends uh, on the thermal properties of the molten metal, of course, but also the shape of this curve will depend on the different features of the mold. So it's important to know that most of the solidification process will happen or will initiate at the mold hair interface. Uh, the other uh, major interface responsible for the solidification of the exchange of heat is at the mold um, material interface. And as you move towards the inner part of the mold, that exchange of heat is um, uh, less and the solidification is uh, delayed. And that obviously has an impact, as we've seen in the previous slides, in terms of the structures of the grains, the shape, the size, and the shape of the grains that we form. But how can we estimate or calculate this solidification time? And again, uh, this solidification time, it's important not just to understand or to estimate when our part is going to be completely solidified, solidified before we open the mold and retrieve the part, but also very importantly to design uh, rises that can maintain um, a specific temperature that allows for the molten metal inside the riser to be in a liquid state to flow uh, into the mold cavity and compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that happens during the solidification process. So the walls of, of the molds uh, normally provide interface of heat extraction from the casting uh, during the cooling. And this begins soon after the metal is uh, poured. The cooling rate is then slower towards the center of the casting as we've seen with the formation of equiaxial uh, grains at the edge of the casting, this thin skin. And as we move towards the inner part of the mold, we have the formation of these column-like uh, grains. The Shvorinov's rule uh, allows us to determine the time it takes for the casting uh, to cool, so the, the part to completely uh, solidify. And uh, this is normally the formula that we use to calculate the solidification, the total solidification time. Uh, and the total solidification time uh, in, this, in this case is equal to a constant of the mold. So this constant depends on different factors, the features, uh, geometrical dimensional features of the mold, but also the material properties of uh, the mold. And this is normally given uh, to you, but also on uh, the volume of your parts and the surface area of your parts. And this N normally takes the value of two. So this is the formula that we can use to estimate the solidification time of your casted part from the moment it enters into the mold until we retrieve it. But again, the same can be used to estimate the solidification time of the material inside the riser. I'd like to just uh, give you this, uh, this question for you to uh, think about, and then we can come back to this on the, on the next uh, lecture. So if you have three uh, metal pieces that you want uh, to cast, uh, in this case, a sphere, a cube, and a cylinder, they all have uh, the same uh, volume. One uh, is a sphere, another is a cube, and the other is a cylinder with a height equal uh, to its uh, diameter. And the question is, based on the solidification uh, time or on the Schwornos rule, uh, which piece do you think it will solidify uh, the fastest and which one uh, is going to solidify the slowest? You can start thinking about it and we can discuss it towards the end of the lecture. Uh, but we'll come back again to this on the next, uh, on the next lecture. So we've been talking a lot about, about shrinkage and the importance of controlling or minimizing the effects of shrinkage. And because of their uh, thermal expansion uh, properties, metals uh, usually 
uh, shrink, or in other words, they usually contract during the solidification and while cooling to the room temperature. So shrinkage, uh, as we have here, which causes, as we've seen, dimensional and geometrical changes in uh, your parts is normally the result of the following uh, three sequential uh, events. The first one, the contraction of the mold or the shrinkage of the mold as it cools down prior to uh, solidification inside uh, the mold. The second, the contraction of the metal during the phase change from liquid uh, to solid already inside the mold. And the contraction of the solidified metal or your casted part uh, as it, the temperature uh, drops to ambient temperature. So you have three uh, phases of solidification that will always have some shrinkage or contraction associated to them. And the liquid and liquid solid contraction normally is compensated by the use of risers. And the volume of the casting uh, normally uh, defines the volume of the riser. So in other words, depending on the volume of the, of the material, of the, of the part that you are casting, depending on the percentage of shrinkage that that specific material will have, then you need to design a riser that can accommodate sufficient volume of molten material to compensate for that specific volumetric shrinkage. And the linear uh, solid contraction is normally given by uh, this volume, uh, by this formula, where uh, delta L is the contraction, L is uh, the starting length, delta T is basically the difference of temperature between the melting temperature of your material and the room temperature or the, or the temperature at which you are uh, conducting your casting uh, process. And alpha is the coefficient of linear expression, which is an intrinsic property of the material that you are uh, using. And obviously you don't need to know all these um, by heart. This is just to give you an idea that normally when you buy a material for casting, and obviously also for other applications that involve uh, melting and solidification, uh, like for example, as we've seen in powder bed fusion, these uh, materials normally um, have associated information related to the volumetric uh, uh, solidification or contraction, okay? And you can have materials with different uh, values of volumetric solidification. Um, I think that the initial idea would always be to select a material that has the lower volumetric uh, solidification or, or contraction, but obviously, uh, specific applications require specific materials. And therefore, sometimes you are limited uh, or you are uh, constrained by the final application of your parts. And you still need to use a material that uh, has a higher volumetric solidification. But independently of that, the important is that by knowing uh, for how much your material will contract, you can use that information to then design risers that can, can compensate for that and still use those materials for uh, the casting of your parts. <clears throat> As any other uh, manufacturing process, there are uh, defects that can arise during the um, generation of your parts. And various defects can uh, developing uh, during the manufacturing using uh, casting processes. These effects can uh, affect both, uh, not just the appearance of your, of your parts, but also the structural integrity and the performance of your parts. So uh, some common defects in metal casting, for example, uh, blow. The blow is a relatively large cavity, uh, as you can see in here, and this, uh, is normally generated by gases uh, which uh, are displaced um, or displace the molten metal um, during uh, the solidification process. In a similar way, and we're talking about surface defects, okay, uh, a scar is a shallow uh, 
blow and occur due to uh, improper uh, permeability or um, the lack of venting systems to extract gases from your uh, mold. It generally occurs on uh, flat surfaces and that's why it has a different name from the blow uh, defects. <clears throat> and finally, uh, a blister, which is a shallow uh, blow like uh, a scar uh, with a very thin layer of metal that uh, covers it. So these are surface defects that normally occur during, uh, during the solidification process inside the mold and often uh, due to uh, entrapped gases. Also, uh, a scab, which is also uh, a surface effect. Uh, this uh, normally occurs when a portion of the face of the mold lifts or, or breaks down, and the recess <clears throat> does making uh, this, uh, uh, this area being filled by uh, metal. The reasons for this to happen are, uh, or can be, or can arise from uh, uh, too fine sands or low permeability of the sands, but also uh, due to the high moisture uh, contents of uh, green sands and uneven uh, molds uh, remming. Wash or a cut is also a typical defect in, uh, in, uh, in metal casting. This is normally a low projection on the drag surface of a casting that extends along the surface, decreasing in height as it extends from one side of the casting uh, to uh, the other end of the casting. It usually occurs when we have bottom gating systems in which the molding sand, for example, has insufficient hot strength and when uh, too much metal is made to flow through one gate into the mold cavity, okay? So these are the reasons why normally wash or cuts uh, are generated. We can also have incomplete filling of uh, the molds or uh, uh, misrun. Uh, the reasons can be, for example, inadequate metal supply, too low molds um, or, or temperature, uh, which basically means that your material will solidify before you completely fill in the molds. Uh, the design of the gates or the entrance into the molds uh, can also uh, happen to be uh, inadequately uh, designed, or the length uh, to thickness ratio of the casting may also be too large. And all of these um, reasons uh, will increase the solidification of uh, your material, which means that it will solidify before it completes, um, completely fills in the mold. Finally, uh, a cold shut uh, or discontinuity. This normally happens when you have two gates, so you have two entrances of material into the mold, and when two streams of liquid metal from these two different gates meet, what will happen is that you have the generation of this interface of these two fronts of material that will not fuse together. So you have a physical well-defined interface. So besides these um, surface uh, defects, we can also have other defects that affect the functionality uh, of our parts. Uh, or tears uh, defects uh, or hard, are defects in casting that occur because the casting uh, cannot shrink freely uh, during the, the solidification process, uh, either because the constraints in the various uh, portions of your uh, material or because the design of your uh, parts where we can have different sections with different thicknesses. And because of that, we're gonna have different solidification rates. And this will cause uh, the generation of hot tears. In this case, uh, uh, exothermic um, compounds may be used uh, to control the cooling rates uh, at these critical sections and avoid uh, hot tearing. So if you have a part that has 
sections with different thicknesses where the solidification will occur at different rates, we can try to homogenize that solidification rate by, by introducing these exothermic compounds to balance the solidification rates in these different sections. And this is just simply to uh, illustrate what happens when you have the formation of these hot seas. So in this initial stage, you have your hexagonal grains surrounded by this uh, still molten uh, material or liquid film. As the solidification process occurs, uh, you'll have more sections being solidified and you'll have a decrease in terms of the liquid interface and this will cause uh, the generation of tensile strains. And as these tensile strains increase due to the solidification process, you'll have uh, the generation of these hot tears or these uh, cracks. But how can we prevent this? And there are different ways to prevent the formation of hot tears. One is to change the design of uh, the casting. So you, we can change the geometry of the casting to try to minimize as much as possible the stress concentrations and hot spots. Hot spots are areas in your casting where the solidification rate occurs at a much slower rate when compared to other areas. But we'll talk about this a bit more in detail. We can use chills. So these chills uh, are normally used in hot spots in order to try to balance the solidification uh, rates, normally to increase the exchange of heat to try to uh, solidify the material uh, much faster. We can also uh, change the strength of the mold by changing, for example, the materials that we use to the mold. And this allows the material, the, the cassette part to shrink without uh, breaking or without cracking. We can try to refine the grain by controlling the solidification rate. And in this case, the idea, <clears throat> sorry, the idea is to have finer grains so that we can minimize the chances of uh, cracking. And we can also control the casting uh, temperature. In this case, uh, a reduction in the casting temperature can be useful uh, to uh, reduce the grain size and therefore reduce the chances of uh, cracking. And um, as we've said, obviously the, the idea, uh, whenever we try to manufacture a part using metal casting is to produce a part that is 100% uh, solid. So we don't have any uh, voids. In this case, uh, we don't have that. So here we have uh, parts or areas uh, inside our cassette parts that, are, uh, that present these, these voids. And this can be detrimental uh, in terms of the mechanical properties. So the existence of these voids, or in other words, the, the existence of porosity <clears throat> is detrimental and should always be avoided during the casting process. It's important also to mention that uh, the porosity in, in, in metal casting may be caused uh, by shrinkage, uh, but not just by shrinkage. It can also be caused by entrained or uh, dissolved gases, or in some cases, by uh, both. And normally porous regions can develop in casting uh, because of uh, shrinkage of um, the solidified metal. And this is the most common reason. So the, 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 the porosity or the development of, of porous structures uh, due to entrained or dissolved gases can be controlled by controlling the flow of the material as we've seen before, but the shrinkage will always be present, okay? And that's why shrinkage or porosity caused by shrinkage is more uh, frequent and more difficult sometimes to control. And by controlling this, we have a chance of um, actually minimizing the detrimental effects of the porosity um, in terms of the ductility of, of a casting uh, part, but also in terms of its surface finish. Uh, and a way of doing this is making the casting permeable and um, 
and therefore avoiding the, 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 the formation of porosity. But how can we eliminate uh, porosity uh, caused by shrinkage? One is to have adequate liquid metal um, supply in order to avoid cavities caused by uh, shrinkage. So the idea here is that we have a flow of material in a, a, a sufficient quantity in order to avoid the formation of these cavities. So to fill in completely the, the, the molds and don't have uh, voids inside our uh, parts. Also, uh, the use of internal uh, chills can uh, normally uh, be used, not just in sand casting, but can be used to control uh, the solidification rate. And by controlling the solidification rate, we can control the grain size. And by controlling the grain size, for example, by uh, refining uh, the grain, we can minimize the existence of these voids and minimize the possibility of developing uh, porous structures. In the case of alloys, this can be uh, minimized by making uh, the temperature gradient steep. So in other words, if you shorten the, uh, the range of temperatures at which the solidification will occur, so making it faster, we can, opt, we can actually uh, reduce the chances of uh, developing uh, porosity. But if we cannot prevent the generation of porosity uh, during the solidification or, or the pouring of the metal, uh, and this happens uh, very often, uh, you can always, after removing your parts from the mold, you can always subject your parts to hot isostatic pressing. And basically what you have is you, you need to put your cassette parts into a chamber where you elevate the temperature just or below the melting temperature of the material. This will allow the, the material to have a limited flow and by applying pressure, you're basically compacting your material and eliminating any voids that you have inside your uh, parts. So <clears throat> chills are a way, a simple way of controlling the solidification rate, of controlling uh, porosity. The function of these chills, as we've mentioned before, is to increase the rate at which our material solidifies in critical regions like hot spots. They are usually made of the same material as the casting, and they are normally left inside. Uh, the casting and they are uh, melted afterwards. It is common to avoid internal shields basically due to the difficulty that we have in fusing them with uh, the cast. So uh, external shields uh, are normally preferred because we can remove them more easily without having to fuse them with the cassette part. And these are some examples of uh, shields that we can use in uh, regions where um, it's uh, likely to develop uh, porosity. So like, for example, here, you have sections that don't have the same thickness. You have the creation of a hot spot that can generate porosity. <clears throat> and by introducing uh, an external shield, you can increase the rate at which the material will solidify in this region, balancing it with the solidification rate at the other regions and therefore minimizing the porosity. So just to summarize, uh, as we've seen today, the composition and the cooling rates of the metal can affect uh, not just the size uh, and the shape of the grains, uh, but also of the dendrites in uh, uh, alloys. It is important to be able to estimate the solidification time uh, for our cassette parts. But it's also very, very important that we're able to estimate the solidification time of the metal that we have in the rises. And this is important to ensure that we always have material, sufficient material in the riser uh, in a molten state to actually be able to compensate for the shrinkage that happens during solidification of the part inside uh, the mold. Uh, 
during solidification, uh, we can have the formation of defects. Porosity can be caused not just by the shrinkage, volumetric shrinkage of your material, but also by entrapped gases. And there are different ways to control or to try to avoid the formation of uh, porosity and hot tears, uh, as we've seen today. Um, and these are relevant if we want to uh, manufacture parts that have adequate uh, geometries, dimensions, but also uh, adequate functional and mechanical uh, properties. And with this, uh, we finish our lecture for uh, today. I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you have.